We're continuing our study of the book of Jude. And to this point, we have noticed in his letter that he has exhorted the readers to contend earnestly for the faith, Jude 3, and that the faith means the whole New Testament system, the gospel system, or any component part of it. It's an obligation of each member of the church, to the best of their ability, to be able to defend the faith they believed and obeyed, and of course through which they will reach heaven. He has made mention of ungodly men. He said they crept in unawares or unnoticed. They came in the side door, not openly, Jude 4. He described those men as men who turned the grace, favor of God, into lasciviousness or licentiousness, simply trying to say that, well, you don't really have to change your way of living because God's grace is so great that it will save you anyway. And he described them as those who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Mind you, these are people purporting to be religious people. And thus, this gets more important because these are using the church to their own ends. And he reminded them of examples of God's righteous condemnation in the past, especially in the Old Testament. He pointed out in Jude verses 5 through 7 as case histories of those who did not continue faithful of the nation of Israel and its wandering in the wilderness because of sin. He even talked about in eternity the angels who sinned and did not keep their first estate. And then he cited the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sad state of affairs that they, they had gotten into because of what is really described in Romans 1 when the Gentiles desired not to retain God in their knowledge and God gave them up to do all of the immoral things they did. Now at this point, Jude follows the example of the Apostle Peter. If you look to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 17, you'll see that Peter says to these Christians, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now let's pause right here. Think with me. Does this sound like some people today? Verse 11, where his angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure, listen, to riot in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. 
These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. I take the time to read that simply because we've already pointed out that Jude follows the outline, if you please, that Peter used. This gives us an insight into the teaching and preaching that went on among all of the faithful, including the apostles and others in the early church. They preached the truth, the same truth, and the whole truth to everybody. And they didn't preach different things. And when it came to warning the church of the evils that would arise from within, from people who might appear superficially to be great people in service to God, but in reality, they're not. It points out that you need to know a person not on the basis of how he looks or sounds, but in view of what he teaches and how he lives that teaching. In verses 8 through 16 and verse 19, Jude talks about these ungodly men in the same way. Notice verse 8, likewise also, now listen to this word to think about it, and I'm not saying Jude was anticipating such things today, but I'm interested in noticing 2,000 years ago, his inspiration was writing part of the New Testament, and most of it, remember, written to Christians to exhort us. In fact, as the song said, to keep us holding to God's unchanging hand, not letting go. How he described them, and think of some terms used today, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, I think some remark needs to be made here about... Uh, What's the body of Moses? Well, knowing that fleshly Israel was a type of spiritual Israel, the church, and knowing that Moses was a type or shadow of the Christ, and that he had bore the same relationship to fleshly Israel as Christ does to the church, and using what we would call common sense, because why would the devil care one way or the other what happened to the flesh, the dead body of Moses? And if I were to ask you what is the body of Christ, you'd have no problem knowing your New Testament what the body of Christ is. It's the church. Now what was the devil or who was the devil after in the wilderness wandering? The body of Moses fleshly Israel. That's what's going on, brethren. In fact, what we're getting here from Peter and Jude, as I said earlier, is a proper way to understand the Old Testament and how it applies to the New Testament and to each one of us as we labor today and benefit from it to stay faithful to the Lord and His church. Notice these people, verse 10, that these speak evil of those things which they know not. Sounds like Peter again. But what they know naturally, now stop right there. What is plaguing this country more and more and the world is secularism. Naturalism is another name for that. What's being said here, they're acting without revelation from God. You don't know the way of salvation and how to even identify a Christian, the way God through Christ saves man, or that he even does so. You don't know the particulars of Christianity if you don't know the revelation of God. But if you don't receive that revelation, you don't believe it, you may not even believe in God or Christ or the Holy Spirit or angels or eternity or spiritual things, then you're not going to pay any attention to the divine volume. So these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally. Notice, what level are they working on? As brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Read Romans 
one. And you will see again, as the Gentiles desired not to retain God in their knowledge, to what depths of depravity they went, because in not wanting to retain God in their knowledge, they certainly didn't care a thing about keeping his word, and thus they lived on that level, and just look around about you. Do you think that Hollywood, we'll let that stand for all sorts of things, none of them good, do you think they operate on a spiritual level or a sensual, material, fleshly level? Well, to ask the question is to answer it, isn't it? He says, woe unto them. There's an exclamation mark there. We studied about the word W-O-E here a few weeks ago. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. Now we understand the significance of Cain in the Old Testament. Here's a New Testament commentary on how God uses Cain. He represents the one who rejected God, who rejected his word, who did as he pleased, who walked on the level of the fleshly appetites and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. Well, if you haven't read your Old Testament about Balaam, then, of course, he was seeking gain if he would curse Israel. Notice for reward. And perished in the gainsaying of Corey. We don't use the word gainsaying much. What he was doing was challenging the authority of Moses, especially and Aaron. And God destroyed him for it, along with his followers. This is the point that needs to be emphasized. Now look at verse 19. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. A sensual person is a person who operates on the level of his fleshly desires. Who sees things basically as they are presented right now and does not see beyond the fleshly. Well, you can see then what they had to contend with for the inspired apostle Peter writes about it. Jude writes about it. And if you go through the New Testament... Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, deals with it. Look at how he writes about Galatians 5, and he talks about the fruit of the flesh. So Jude does more than simply repeat Peter. He reinforces Peter's words and adds more information about these ungodly men. He also lets us know how to define who an ungodly is, an ungodly man is, how to recognize an ungodly person. So in this particular sermon, we're considering Jude's description of what he calls ungodly dreamers, noticing that what he said of them is summarized in verse 8. I'll read it again. Likewise. Also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. I would say today we have a host of those folks. You say, well, yeah, but he's talking about people who claim to be Christians in the church. He's warning the faithful about them. That's right. Now, question to you, in all honesty, do you think none of these people are in the church today? If you look at those who teach doctrines, that would loose us from what the doctrine of Christ binds on us as to the way we are to live in order to be faithful. You will find a host of congregations who are seeking to justify people in their worldliness. Same type of people, folks. When they get through giving you their explanation on passages that pertain to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, when you get to their conclusions about them, you can live any way you want to, pretty much, in those areas. They have defined repentance basically to say, well, I'm sorry, but there's no real changing of one's life. And you'll see then, well, grace is all that we need. Well, grace is favor, and we don't understand. We, we can't merit God's favor. We can't earn it. That's true. But that's on God's side of the fence. God has extended his favor through Christ 
But God's never offered salvation to man and done for him what man could do for himself. So being a free moral agent, I can learn how faith responds to God. And the only way faith responds to God that saves us from our sins is to obey God. Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. And James talks about that in James chapter 2. Faith apart from works is dead. What kind of works? Not meritorious works. Certainly not the works of the law of Moses. Paul said, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, then what kind of works do you have in mind in James 2? Our response through faith, and faith comes by hearing the Word of God, in obedience to the terms of pardon. And that's exactly what he's talking about. And when it comes to living the Christian life, once you're in the church, your old sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, the waters of baptism when you were baptized to his death, and you're raised to walk in newness of life, what keeps you going because you're not flawless? You're going to sometime or another think a sinful thought or not say what you ought to say when you ought to say it or say something that's wrong or do something that's wrong or leave undone what you ought to do. What do you do about that? You don't intend to if you're faithful. You don't want to if you're faithful. You want to do right the opposite. But what do you do? There's an ever-present reality that you confess regarding your need of Christ and His mercy and that when you see specific sins in your life, you confess those sins and pray to God for forgiveness. That's all a part of the grace of God. As Paul said to Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us something we must do to benefit from the grace of God. It's not just grace only. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, what's Jude teaching on here? Teaching us that denying ungodliness, what is Jude teaching? Teaching these people how to do that. How to recognize those that teach contrary to what Paul said. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live righteously, soberly, godly, in this present world. So you see, Titus was told by Paul to do basically what the whole book of Jude's all about. He just goes into detail in Jude as to how you deny ungodliness and who the ungodly are, how you live righteously, what that means you take on in your life and what it means you reject in your life and how to identify those people who teach contrary to these things. So we're looking at these ungodly dreamers that we see mentioned in verse 8. They, notice, defile the flesh. They reject authority. They speak evil. Now, I don't know what's evil and what's not if I don't know the truth. God's Word tells me what is right, and whatever is contrary to God's Word is evil. So, again, there's an understanding here, tacitly, that you've got to study your Bible every day all the time and honestly and objectively do it and apply it to your life to be able to do these things. What if these people received this letter from Jude and didn't even read it? Or two or three read it and put it aside in the shelf? No, they all were to read it and understand it's from God and it has to do with how you live the Christian life, how you stay faithful, how to recognize ungodly people particularly as it was bothering them then. But think about how this fits our day and time. Do you want in the Lord's church, and it's the Lord's church, not your church, not my church. It's the Lord's church. And if it's kept the Lord's church, it'll be because the members who make it up keep the Lord's will. If you want to make it your church or our church, then just stop doing the Lord's will and it will be our will that's done and it'll be our church. So just remember, he's showing them how to remain true to the Lord, how to identify these that defile the flesh, these that reject authority, these that speak evil. Now look at them all around us, growing more every day. We see it on the news all the time, these filthy dreamers. Do you want them in the church? 
One of the wonderful things about the gospel of Christ that does not get emphasized as it ought to be is that the gospel purely preached in practice and defended will keep out of the church those that shouldn't be there. When you compromise and water down the truth, you're going to let in people God doesn't want in. Well, I thought he wants everybody to be saved. He does, but to be saved from your sins, you must comply in humility, being humble and meek to his will, not your own. And his will is presented only in one place, the Bible in general and the New Testament of the Christ in particular. These people are being warned, lest this get into the church. The old saying goes, God meant for the church to be in the world. Like he meant, or we mean, for a boat to be in the water. But we know what happens when the water gets in the boat. Enough of it and it sinks. Can't even be what a boat's supposed to be and why we would have one in the first place. And so it is when it comes to the church. The ark of safety is the church. And to live the gospel and to preach it and defend it is to keep the church pure. And we do not want to allow these kinds of people to be in the church. Oh, we wish they would repent. That's what we lay before. It's what I have personally as a gospel preacher all these years and continue to do so as long as I'm able. But there are people I know who will not receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their souls. Now, is this new? Well, if you read 2 Peter and Jude, it must not be new. And when you realize again, as I've said over these last several weeks many times, most of the New Testament is to keep each one of us saved once we've been baptized into Christ. Notice they speak evil, 8 through 11. They speak evil of dignitaries. The word dignitaries comes from Greek word doxa. It means uh, dignity or glorious. It means honor. It means praise. It means worship. Are there people today who make light of those things? Are there stand-up comics who make light of God, Christ, gospel? what they understand a Christian to be. What about the government? You can have somebody in the Senate who says concerning prostitution, why if two consenting adults want to do that, why shouldn't it be legal? Of course, I'm sure that works of taxing and raising more taxes. But what is that, Brad? if it doesn't fit what Jude is talking about and what Peter warns about. Do you want to have the church? You have some people saying, oh, well, you know, we can't really get all that beside ourselves over homosexuality, transgender, transvestite, whatever else. And you've got to be careful, don't you know, this is going out over to YouTube, David, and it's focusing in on the spring church and every member of it, and somebody's liable to hear it, and, oh, you're in big trouble. Well, let's put it this way. Paul said he wasn't only ready to go up to Jerusalem to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem. And I can't have the same attitude as the peerless apostle Paul about preaching the truth and living it. I don't need to be standing here. In fact, you don't need to be sitting there if you don't have the same attitude about the truth and preaching the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So who cares in the sense of letting that kind of thing stop us from doing what we know is right? We ought to be wise. We ought to be particular how we choose our words. But that can only go so far, folks. And you can't let being wise get you into compromising to where you won't say to people what they need to hear. People in positions of authority in general aren't appreciated today. In fact, they're not just ignored, they're opposed openly. Now, I would be the first one, as I think law enforcement officers who honestly strive to do their duty, 
would admit too. You can have people who are bad apples. But is that just having to do with law enforcement officers? Does your family have any bad apples in it? Does your neighborhood have any bad apples in it? Does the school system or the company you work for or our schools in general, do they have bad apples, put that in quotes, in it? Can any institution, even the home, especially the home, function properly without final authority to govern it in such a way and certain roles for husbands and fathers and wives and mothers and parents? Does the New Testament, the Bible in general, address those things? So somewhere there's always a bad apple. But why? Throw out all of the good who are trying to do what they ought to do as much as humans can with the few who abuse and misuse. If we did that, we ought to reject the Jerusalem church because I seem to remember Ananias and Sapphira. But God only dealt with those who needed to be dealt with and didn't reject the whole church. But look around us. Any body in authority, any exercise of authority, any demand to call people into account for violating properly constituted authority. And you see it in the church. And you see people rebelling against it. That spirit was there in the first century and the Holy Spirit addressed it in their times and recorded it in the book that will judge us all on the last day. And so it can be applied now. Ungodly dreamers wouldn't hesitate to speak evil. They did then, they do now. Looking even further, you don't have to engage into a fit with the other side. You can be like the angel the Lord rebuke you. Here is the truth of God's word on the way you ought to live. Are you living that way? No. Don't be ashamed of yourself because you're going to hell if you die that way. You can say that. And you can say it in the right way. And you can announce it frankly, candidly, boldly, and pointedly to the members of the church as well as those out in our society. Now if they oppose you, it's going to be because they don't like to think that you have a right to say anything, you have a right to knuckle under. That's where we are in America today, and don't think it doesn't show up in the church. They speak against and oppose whatever they do not know, verses 10 and 11. They're not afraid to rebuke dignitaries. They don't hesitate to speak evil of things they know nothing about. And what they know naturally in that they corrupt themselves, we notice. I refer you back to 2 Peter 2.12. And in conducting themselves in this manner, they've gone the way of Cain, whose works were evil. James, or rather John talks about that in 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And there, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and brothers righteous. You know... Do you see today, and it will be at the end of time, however long or short that is, the attitude in Cain that exists in many people today? I did wrong, you do wrong, you try to tell me I'm wrong, and I'll knock you in the head for it. It's not up to discussion and rational approaches to things and letting the other side be heard. It's just a matter of slapping them down when they don't agree with you. 
Cain didn't act out of faith. Hebrews 11 and 4 makes that clear. Since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 11, 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. He being dead yet speaketh. That is, we all serve God the same way. We accept His Word as His will and we seek to obey it. Surely this should caution us about speaking evil of others. James warned about the dangers of the tongue. James 3, 2 through 12. Even when it comes in the church as our brothers and sisters in Christ, do we speak evil of them? And I define evil again to mean do we speak contrary to the truth about them? Do we say things about them we could not prove? Do we handle it as the Bible says it ought to be between brethren? Paul also wrote Titus to counsel Christians not to speak evil of others. He was a preacher and was to apply it to his own life as a Christian, but he was to teach it to Christians concerning how they ought to live, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. When we add the example of the ungodly dreamers and their quickness to speak evil of others, then we need to take note and order our lives accordingly. They defile the flesh, 12 through 15 and verse 19. They, they were spots, as he calls it, verses 12 and 19, in their love feast, and the brethren getting together because they love one another to do whatever it is they did. Feasting without fear, they served only themselves, and they were, as I said earlier, sensual persons. In 2 Peter 2.13, Peter says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Literally, their carousings and their own lies and deceptions while they say, we're just like you and we can help you. Are there people like that around about us today? Certainly. How far had they gone down the drain, if you want to call it that, verses 12 and 13? He said, clouds without water carried about by the winds. You need rain desperately. Here come the clouds, but there's no rain. They promise blessings, but there's not any blessings. Withered trees without fruits, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. They're barren when they ought to be bearing fruit. But it's not just that. They've been pulled up by the roots. They can't get any sustenance. But they promise you all sorts of wonderful things if you'll just Put us where we need to be. Raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. Well, we just had hurricanes. Go down to the beach. You can see what all was foamed up out of the upset water by the great winds. So their shame comes forth in their words and in their behavior. So Jesus was right, wasn't he? By their fruits ye shall know them. He says, they're wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They shine for a moment. They have a glitter to them, but they have no direction. They have no orbit. And in time, they're gone forever. And that's what they offer. And you'll go with them if you follow them. Their condemnation was promised long ago, he says in verses 14 to 15. He said, first of all, by Enoch, the man who walked with God and was not because God took him, Genesis 5, 24. Even Enoch back then in the patriarchal age prophesied of the Lord's coming. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints. 1 Thessalonians 3, 13 and 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. He's coming to execute judgment on everyone, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He is coming to convict all who are ungodly, such as these ungodly dreamers, then and now, of their ungodly deeds committed in an ungodly way, of harsh things spoken against the Lord and by His godly followers. They were ungodly sinners. They 
speak evil and they defile the flesh. In other words, they live according to their own will. The Word of God means nothing to them as far as it directs their thinking, their lives, their planning, their purposes. They reject authority, verses 16 and 19. This is evidenced by the way they speak. Jude has informed us that contrary to apostolic teaching, they were very quick to speak evil. And all you have to do is look around about you and see. Jude tells us that they are murmurers and complainers. Thus they show, they demonstrate a lack of respect for apostolic authority. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10 and Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Their use of flattery was also condemned by the apostles. Remember Paul addressed that at the end of his Roman epistle in Romans 16, 17, and 18. It talks about their good words and fair speeches whereby they beguile the hearts of the simple or innocents. How do you know them? Well, it's evidenced by the way they walk, by the way they live. They walk according to their own lusts as sensual persons. And you can't do that and be in submission to apostolic authority. 1 Peter 2, 11, and chapter 1, verse 14. Thus divisions are brought about by their actions. Romans 16, 17, and 18, where Paul is talking about false teachers who did that very thing and warned the church at Rome about them. Again, Romans 16, 17, and 18. So what can we say? Well, there's a lot more in these books sometimes. A little bitty one chapter book like this then we realize that's as fresh as this morning's news. And there's nothing fake about this. The end of these ungodly dreamers is stated clearly. As the Apostle Paul emphasized, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, Galatians 5.21. And as stated by the Apostle Peter, to whom the gloom or darkness uh, is reserved for forever. Second Peter 2.17 And as Jude said, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude 15. Jesus talked about those who would be the unprofitable servant cast into outer darkness on the day of judgment where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Brethren, it's all here to warn us as fresh as I said is this morning's news that's accurate and he's exhorting these people not to be led astray by such folks but to stay with the truth the apostles had brought them think about what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 though we are an angel from heaven preaching the other gospel to you then that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed and you've just seen the kind of people that would do such things that Jude describes particularly if we will think a little bit about this, you'll see that much of what is in vogue today in America is governing everything in America in general is addressed by Jude and addressed really by the whole New Testament. And have they gotten into the church? We said earlier, indeed, they have. And we must recognize that. And we must keep ourselves pure just like Jude and Peter wanted the people of that day and time to do so. Well, we studied what to do to become a Christian. We've seen what to do if as a child of God you sin and repenting of your sins, confessing Him and praying God for forgiveness. We have another opportunity to where we've been exhorted to do what we know is right, as Jude was doing when he wrote that letter. And if you need then to obey the truth in whatever way, then now's the time to do it. All together we stand and sing.